Hey, so we've been talking about forces and doing our forces unit for physics classes. This is also a good foundation for AP physics classes as well. And so I've got two GIF animations I've made through that O physics website. I'll put a link to that underneath in the comments below. So we are going to be talking about kinetic and static friction today, how to solve problems with them, what the equations are, what the variables mean even, because they are a little bit different than what you may be used to. So let's take a look at this animation here first. What's happening is you have an object that's pushed up a ramp. It's a pretty steep angled ramp, and that object goes up and it slides back down. So it's going to reset right now, slides up, and slides back down. So it's always essentially in motion, except for a brief moment of time when it's up here. And the force due to gravity is just too much. Gravity pulls it back, overcomes friction, and that's what's happening here. So let's take a look at this GIF animation over here and talk about this GIF, GIF, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but this object is different. It's pushed up a ramp, and the ramp is much less severe in terms of the angle. The angle is a lot more shallow, and so you can see it go slide up, and it comes to a stop. And that is what would happen if you had just a very slight angle and you had a fair amount of friction for an object like imagine a textbook that you're pushing up a desk that's at an angle or something like that and it's able to stick and stay there that stationary friction that we're looking at is going to be called static friction when it comes to a stop the initial part is called kinetic friction so there are these two different types of friction that we need to talk about kinetic and static friction and so we're going to go about doing that let's take a look at what the free body diagram would look like in two different scenarios for the first animation so for this object when it is pushed initially it slides up and then it slides back down well while it's moving up the ramp you've got your normal force your force due to gravity pulling straight down and you've got your kinetic friction force operating in the opposite direction of motion that is always the case. Friction always, always, always points in the direction opposite that of motion or a possible motion when you have two objects in contact with each other, sliding past each other, or just in contact with each other. And if we take a look at the scenario when it's moving down the ramp, when it's sliding back down, notice that your frictional force is going to be pointing now up the ramp. And that's because, again, friction always, always, always points in the direction opposite that of motion or a possible motion. Let's take a look at the next animation here. And so here it is starting and then it comes to a stop. So our free body diagram while it's in motion is going to look like this. You have a kinetic friction force operating in the opposite direction of motion. And then when it comes to a stop, you've got your static friction force holding it in place. That is going to be pointing up the ramp. Let's think about why that is. This object would normally slide down. In other words, if there was no friction whatsoever, it would slide back down. Why is that? Well, one way to describe that is if you think this is going straight down, but if we tilt our axis right here, so this would be the y-axis, this is going to be the x-axis right here, and we were to break this vector into components, you would see that there is a component parallel to the ramp right here that's in the positive x-axis to the right in the x-axis. That object is remaining in equilibrium. It's, it's essentially coming to a stop because that frictional force right here is opposing the force due to gravity in the x-axis. And they happen to be enough. This happens to be sufficient to cause it to come to a stop. All right, so we have talked about two different types of friction, static friction, kinetic friction. I do want you to try this for a moment. Take your hand and slam it down on the table in front of you. Just slap it down and I want you to push kind of hard on the desk or table in front of you and I want you to push your hand across the table and push hard enough so that it's kind of a challenge to make this happen and I want you to ask yourself this question while you do this which is harder to do is it harder to keep your hand in motion or is it harder to get your hand started all right so hopefully you have done this and thought about this a little bit but it typically turns out most students can get this. Not all students can get this, but most students will get the idea that, oh yeah, it's if I pay attention, it's actually harder to get my hand started. Once I have my hand in motion, I got to keep it in motion or then it just becomes a bunch of static over and over. And that's hard to do. In other words, it is harder to overcome static friction than it is to overcome kinetic friction. That is a thing. Let's talk about why that is. And so first of all, what causes friction and why is static friction larger than kinetic? Well, there are two parts to this explanation. The easy explanation is it's almost like puzzle pieces fitting together. So 
let me back up for a second. Any two objects that have a surface that interact with each other, even if that surface appears to be smooth, it's actually not. For the vast majority of everyday objects, there is some roughness. And if you were able to have a scanning probe microscope that was able to detect things on the molecular or atomic level, you would know that there are bumps all over the place on both of these surfaces. And so when these surfaces are not moving, there is more time to settle and to lock into place. So the hills of one side can kind of fill in valleys of another side occasionally a little bit more than if they were just sliding past each other because the hills of both sides in those cases are just bouncing off each other if you're in constant motion but if they're stationary if, if it's a static situation then you have time for those things to kind of settle down and to lock into place a little bit more the second reason for this is based on chemistry and so you may have had chemistry you may not have had chemistry if you haven't had chemistry this is probably not going to make much sense to you as I explain this. If you have, please try to think in terms of chemistry for a moment. So if these objects are stationary, what happens is you can get rotation of molecules or atoms. Like this hydrogen atom can kind of swing out of the way, exposing this partial negative charge here because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And you have this partial negative charge here, partial positive charge here. And so if there is a static situation, you can have this rotation of atoms or movement of molecules in such a way that those intermolecular forces can interact more greatly. These are weak forces, but if you have enough of them, they can build up to be something significant. So this is another reason why static friction is going to be greater than kinetic friction. All right, and so let's take a look at what these friction equations are. So first of all, for the kinetic friction equation, I do want to say at first glance that we have these absolute value symbols in here. So some books and some teachers will not use that. But the problem is you, you can run into errors later if you don't use these absolute value symbols. So you're going to have FK, that's the force due to kinetic friction, is equal to mu K. So first of all, don't let that freak you out. We don't have that letter in our alphabet. It's in the Greek alphabet. And it's the coefficient of kinetic friction. I'm going to explain what that is down here. It's really just a ratio of the kinetic friction force over the normal force. And then this is times the absolute value of the normal force over here. So that's implied times times the absolute value of the normal force. If you don't know what the normal force is, please take a look at my video that I will post a link to in the upper right right now because you'll actually need to know what the normal force is to be able to work with this equation. If you take a look down here, if I isolate for mu k, then I can say that's fk over fn. So that kind of gives you an idea what the coefficient of kinetic friction is. Let me put it this way. If this is a higher number, then that would be something like two surfaces that don't move past each other very well. Like apparently rubber and concrete, if you put them next to each other, they're really hard to move and they take a tremendous amount of force to be able to get them to slide past each other. Whereas if you had something like ice on top of ice, they would slide past each other very, very easily. And so this mu k would have a very low amount for ice on ice or a very high amount for like rubber on concrete. I do have these terms written out over here. Let's take a look at our next equation. So this is going to be very similar with one key difference over here. So everything else looks the same except for mu s. Notice there are two different variables here. Mu k and mu s are different. And then this over here is the static force maximum amount. This is the maximum static force amount over here. So we're going to talk about that. You can do a problem and solve for the maximum and actually get less applied in this situation. So I will talk you through why that is. And again, the coefficient of static friction is this ratio between the static friction force and the normal force. Lastly, I do want to mention if you're an AP student, there is a combined equation over here, and this is what it looks like on the AP equation sheet. They do a good job of reminding you whenever we're dealing with vectors. This is the vector notation over here and over here. It looks very similar, except there is this less than or equal to. And instead of writing two equations, they write one. So they're going to call it a force due to friction, like a generalized friction. And it's up to you to apply that in a static or a kinetic sense, if it's not moving or if it's in motion in the kinetic sense. All right, and we're going to be talking about what is up with this less than or equal to symbol and how to apply that. But before we do, I want to give you some quick examples of these mu s and mu k values and what they would look like if you're dealing with like rubber on glass, you would have higher than a 2.0. And if you have steel on steel, you would have 0 0.74.
this is a biological connection here your joints between your bones are fantastic in their ability to reduce friction they have very very low mu k and mu s values for these things and that actually helps us a lot because it helps reduce friction and wear and tear on our joints pretty amazing now notice there are no units for this table and i can go back to the last slide briefly so you get the idea why if i have force in newtons over here and force in newtons down below the units cancel and I'm left with a unitless number that just gives us an idea of how strong the friction is. All right, and lastly, I need to talk about what's up with this less than or equal to symbol. So this is the AP version of the equation. So static friction has a maximum value, but the surface interaction between two objects can provide less friction than that maximum static value. All right, so what does this mean? So let's imagine you have your hand on a desk and you're gonna apply a force forward of 10 newtons and there's a maximum static friction force of 10 newtons backwards, is this hand going to move? The answer is no, it's not going to move. And that's because the forces are balanced, so there's no net force. And because of that, there's no acceleration. Well, what about if you provide a initial force on your hand from your arm and your shoulder muscles and so on of 12 newtons to the left, and there is a maximum friction value in the backwards direction of 10 newtons to the right, is this hand going to move? And the answer is yes, because there is a net force of two newtons to the left, so it will accelerate to the left with that net two newtons of force. Well, what if you still have a maximum of 10 newtons that you can apply before this thing moves? Will it accelerate at this point? What's gonna happen is the hand is gonna experience a backwards force of only five newtons, even though this could be up to 10 newtons, because it's only applying five newtons in the forward direction. So that 10 newtons, if we calculate it using this equation over here and we get 10 newtons, that would be, well, the static friction force can be up to 10 newtons, but if we don't provide enough force in the forward direction, then it's gonna be less. And in this case, is the hand gonna accelerate or is it not gonna accelerate? The answer is it's not gonna move, it's not gonna accelerate. Let me give you one more question to see if you understand this. All right, let's say we calculated this and we came up with 10 newtons of force would be the maximum force that could be handled between the hand and the tabletop here. And we go ahead and put in 10 newtons in our free body diagram. And we know that there is five newtons in the forward direction being applied. Would this universe make sense? Would this make sense? First of all, this would accelerate in the backwards direction. Let's start thinking about this. Let's say a physics student is doing this. Would this make sense? The answer is no. Um, this problem would not make sense, and the universe in which this happened would not make sense either. I'm not even sure what all of the ramifications would be, but essentially what would happen is every time you tried to move something, but were not able to move it because friction was too great, you would get accelerated backwards. That would not make sense. And so because of that, we want to say, well, there is a maximum calculated amount of friction, but there can be less than that provided, especially in a static sense. In other words, we would not get a scenario like this, but we could get a scenario like this, even if our FS was a maximum 10, if our forward force was only five newtons, our backwards force would only be up to that five newtons. It wouldn't be greater than that. Otherwise you would have a hand accelerating in the backwards direction which would not make sense at all. All right, so that was a longer screencast, important concepts there though. And I do need to give a couple example problems. I'm gonna do that in the next screencast. Hopefully this has been helpful. Thanks for listening and have a great day.